Last week, we kicked off a brand new sermon series that we've titled Hashtag More. We walked through Paul's second prayer in the book of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 3 from verse 14 to 21. Uh, that was to kind of give context to help set it up for us, because here's why. We believe, we believe that God is calling us to more. In this year, he's calling us to more, more of his presence, more of his power, and more of his promises. Where in our lives, in community, and then in our mission. Uh, I truly, truly believe that. Hashtag more. And so we're going to continue talking about that. In fact, over the next few weeks, we're going to be unpacking some of those things, and then we'll uh, continue to unpack them throughout the year. And so today, this morning, I want to talk about fruitfulness. All right, I want to talk about fruitfulness. Uh, what would you say if I said God calls us to a life of fruitfulness, that God desires his children to be blessed with fruitfulness in every area of our lives. Yeah. How would you respond? I believe that some in this room would go, amen. I believe that. I'm in for that. Whilst others might go, wait, God calls us to, to fruitfulness? Like, I know faithfulness, but I, I didn't know that, that God calls us to be fruitful. And then a ton of you might be somewhere in the middle, and your response to me might be, Oni, you need to be a little bit more careful. <laughs> Sounds like you might be heading towards the prosperity gospel. You know, my conservative, reformed brothers and sisters, of which I am one of them, okay? I am, I am all of the above. I'm everything that you want me to be. I have become all things, like Paul says, okay? So, so, so but don't worry. I, I don't believe in the prosperity gospel. I don't. I believe that that is from the very pits of hell. In fact, any gospel that has an adjective in front of it, we should be very careful because the gospel doesn't need an adjective. It doesn't, it doesn't need anything else to make it good news. It just simply is good news, the gospel. All right, so, so, so don't panic. That's not what I'm about to preach, but I do believe that God calls us to a life of fruitfulness. And so... I would do this. I would say, let's all start with a clean page so that we might all learn together, so that we might all see that in this season, this hashtag more, that God is calling us to fruitfulness. Permit me this morning to develop a theology of fruitfulness. Because I believe so many of us are missing out on what God wants to do in and through you and we're missing out because of our lack of understanding regarding this theology, this beautiful thing called fruitfulness that God wants us to live in. God has given us, his children, the ability to be fruitful, to enjoy fruitfulness, and to increase in fruitfulness. Let me say that to you again. God has given us the ability to be fruitful, to enjoy fruitfulness and to increase in fruitfulness. Let me show you. Genesis chapter 1. We'll go right to the beginning. Verse 27 to 28. It says this. So God created man in his own image. He created him in the image of God. He created them male and female. God blessed them. He blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, and every creature that crawls on the earth. But he calls us to be fruitful, to multiply. See, the call from the very beginning has always been fruitfulness. A kind of fruitfulness that covers the earth. And so the question is, what happened? Well, we happened. You see, we are and continue to be the problem to this call. Our sin gets in the way. We are our greatest obstacle to fruitfulness. If you're, if you're trying to figure out, like, from the very beginning, so then what happened? Us, we happened. Our sin, our sin gets in the way. In fact, things got so bad that God decided to flood the earth and start again. He literally hit the reset button. 
He, he was like, I've called them to fruitfulness, but look at what they're doing. I can't, I, I just can't. I'm starting again. Floods the earth. And so after the water died down, many of us are familiar with this story. It's Noah and the ark. After the water died down, he then makes a covenant, a vow, a promise to never do that again. Hashtag rainbow. It's ours. A sermon for another day. He promises to never do that again, gives us the rainbow, and then he says this, Genesis chapter 9 verse 1, God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. God gave Noah and his family and Adam and Eve the same command after starting something new. It seems like that's his strategy. That he starts something new, he blesses, and then he says, go be fruitful. Go be fruitful. And so if, if, if that's his MO, if that's what he does, then, then why would we think that he would do something different with us? If that's the pattern, then why don't we just follow it? Friends, this is why... Jesus says in John chapter 10, verse 10, a thief comes only. I need, I need you to see that word. Only. Only. That means that, that the only purpose of this thief, and this thief is Satan, right? The only purpose is to steal and kill and destroy. And so when we buddy buddy with the thief, because it's like, no, 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 no. He said that with me, things will be different. Don't be foolish. Jesus says he only comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But then he says, I have come so that they may have life and have it in abundance. Fruitfulness. A abundance. That's what, that's what Jesus says. He says, I, I come to give you life and I give it abundantly. See, true fruitfulness begins in the heart. It begins with a change of heart, a heart that has been captured by the grace of God through Jesus by the power of the Spirit. If you want an abundant life, a fruitful life, then you must surrender your life to Jesus as Lord and Savior. That, that, that's where it starts. If you want a fruitful life, life, then you have to. You have to surrender your life to Jesus as your Lord and Savior. There is no shortcutting this. And, and, and we try. Oh, we try. But there is, there is no shortcutting this. Once Jesus becomes the king of your heart, he deposits the Holy Spirit, who among many things brings the fruit of the Spirit. There it is again, fruitfulness. So right at the beginning, right at the beginning of your new life, surrender it to Jesus, Holy Spirit deposited, the fruit of the Spirit takes root. Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 to 23. It says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, Peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And I love the fact that Paul writes this. The law is not against such things. There is a lot of things that the law is against, that the law does not like, that the law says, hey, whoa. But these things, it's all good. It's all good. In fact, we should be praying for more of those things. And here's the thing. You cannot receive the fruit of the Spirit without the Spirit. Yeah. Did, yeah. Did, did you hear that? I know it sounds obvious, but sometimes the way we live, it's like, no, 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 no. I, maybe I didn't get it. You cannot receive the fruit of the Spirit without the Spirit. And then you cannot receive the Spirit without surrendering to God through Jesus. Yeah. You, you just can't. Yeah. You simply cannot there can be no fruitfulness if you try another way. God has intended it to be this way. This is the process. This is the plan. Repentance and faith. 
Repentance simply means to turn away from whatever it is that you are running to, hoping that you will find life, meaning, and satisfaction in, and going, it's not giving me what I want. So you turn from those things, and then you turn to Jesus, and you put your trust in him. That's what it means, repentance and faith. You see, this inner fruit from the Spirit, it affects not just our heart, but our actions too. It doesn't just affect our heart. We don't just stop there. It affects our actions too. This is why James says, faith without works is dead. It's because he, he understood it. I mean, other than the fact that like, he spent most of his childhood with Jesus, right? He's, he's, he's a half older brother, which must have been like super intense, right? Super, super intense. But he understood that, that faith without works is dead. It's not on a timeout. It's not on pause. It's not waiting. No, it's dead. Because this inner fruit from the spirit affects our actions. The things we think about, the words we speak, the deeds we do are all impacted. And they're all impacted for one agenda and one agenda only. And that is to glorify God and accomplish his will. That's the purpose to glorify God and to accomplish his will. Inside is meant to come outside. That's another way to say it, right? I shortened it for you. Uh, you can fit on your Twitter thing. It's enough characters. Inside is meant to come outside. And so that means we need to stop this thing of like, no, 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 it's just in the heart. I worship in my heart. I praise in my heart. I give in my heart. <laughs> Hmm? If that were the case, guys, we'd be, I'd be killing it. I would. But, but it's got to make its way outside. And if it's not, hear me this morning, if it's not, we should be concerned. We should be concerned. I mean, listen to what Jesus says when he, he, he warns us about false prophets. All right, that's, that's the context here, but I want you to, to, to listen how he puts this together because he uses fruit as an example. Matthew chapter 7, verse 15 to 20. He says this, Beware of false prophets who come disguised as harmless sheep but are really vicious wolves. You can identify them by their what? By their What? By their fruit, that is, by the way they act. He's making it so plain, so plain, because I, for some strange reason in the church, there's this thing now where it's like, you know what, it's not about my actions, it's not, you know, don't judge me, don't, do that. like it's, it's the weirdest thing, and yet we open up the scriptures, and it's right, Jesus says it himself, by the way they act. Can you pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? A good tree produces good fruit. A bad tree produces bad fruit. It feels like he's a grade one teacher. <laughs> right? He's, just, he's making it as simple as possible because it would seem obvious, right? Like we should simply go, no, things aren't going well here. But he goes, no, you can't. Let me tell it to you. A good tree can't produce bad fruit. And a bad tree can't produce good fruit. So every tree that does not produce good fruit is chopped down and thrown into the fire. Yes, just as you can identify a tree by its fruit, so you can identify people by their actions. Jesus is saying, show me. I love you. Show me. I'll give, I'll give. I'm getting way ahead of myself. That stuff is coming. Just wait. I'm setting the context. God's desire is to transform us into the image of his son. And to make us fruitful as he was. And Jesus was both fruitful inward and outward. He is molding us and shaping us to become more and more like Jesus, who is both fruitful inward and outward. That is the very plan, the very purpose. And so that should lead us to the conclusion that fruitfulness 
matters. All right? Fruitfulness matters. And God desires for you to be fruitful. In fact, I would take this a step further. I would say this. We as a community, we as a, as a congregation, as a church, we need you. We need you. We need you. We need you to be fruitful. If we are going to flourish, we need you to be fruitful. Fruitfulness matters. Friends, I don't just want to survive in 2023. I don't want to get to the end of 2023 and go, whew, guys, we survived. (laughs) I don't even want to get to the end of the year. I want to, like two months from now, I want to go, oh, we're flourishing, guys. Look at what God is doing in and through us. That's God's desire for us. That's what he wants for us. Now, I know many of you, many of you still may not be convinced. And that's okay. That's okay. Let me rub your noses in the Bible. Because the Bible is filled with passages that talk about fruitfulness. You're going, oh no, I hear you, and you've, you've read some things about Jesus, but no, 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 let, me, let me give you some Bible. Some of you want some Bible, and that's a good thing. You should. Yeah. You should. Yeah. Yeah. So let's walk through a few scriptures. See, you and I, we were created for fruitfulness. I've already shown you in the beginning, Genesis 1, 27 to 28, that since we are created in God's image, one of the many things that we are called to be is fruitful. God himself is fruitful. We are created in his image. Therefore, we are called to be fruitful. God could have done everything himself. And yet, by his own choice, decided to create us to work in union with him to bring about flourishing and fruitfulness to the world. That that literally blows my mind every time I think about it. Because I'm going, God... You have all these commands here, these things that you call us to do. You spoke everything into existence, and yet you're patient enough to go, I'll wait. Let's go. You and, you and me together in this, let's go. By his own choice, by grace, we get to participate in his work. You and I were created for fruitfulness. Here's another one. You and I were, were commanded to fruitfulness. We are to be fruitful and multiply, not just in physical things like work and family and relationships, but more importantly, spiritual things. As disciples of Jesus, we are commanded to go out and make disciples. Who do what? Who in turn will go out and make more disciples. And then they'll go out and make more disciples and more disciples and more disciples. That's fruitfulness. And so uh, the Great Commission itself speaks to us being called to fruitfulness. You and I were appointed for fruitfulness. So we weren't just beautifully designed, but, but, then, but then we're appointed. There, there, is, there is something that is put on us. There is a, a label, a title. There's something given to us that says, now go and be fruitful. It was the Lord's choice to give you the amazing privilege to excel and to exhibit your fruitfulness. It was his choice to do that. Now, you you may have experienced rejection in the past. I get that. Many of us, we do. Whether it's a job offer, whether it's not being picked for the team, whether it's family, we've all experienced rejection. But hear this. Your heavenly father has chosen you to become his child. That he, he looks at you in your depravity, At the bottom of the pit, in darkness, he goes, you know what? You. I choose you. And not only that, he appoints you for an assignment. You are chosen and appointed. John 15, verse 16 says this. You did not choose me, but I chose you. I appointed you. I appointed you to go and produce what? What? To produce fruit, and that your fruit should remain. So whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. So I'm asking now, fruitfulness, Lord, that's what I want. That's what we want. 
you and I were redeemed for fruitfulness. The word redeems means to buy out. The term was used specifically in reference to the purchase of a slave's freedom, like for them to get freedom. That's, that's what the word redeemed means. Freedom from a life of sin and bondage. I'm no longer a slave to sin. I no longer belong to Satan. I belong to God. Your freedom has been granted. And one of the reasons that your freedom has been given to you is so that you may be fruitful. Romans chapter 7, verse 4. Paul writes, therefore, my brothers and sisters, you also were put to death in relation to the law through the body of Christ so that you may belong to one another. You belong to him who was raised from the dead in order that we may bear fruit. Fruit for God. You and I were redeemed for fruitfulness. Guys, it's, it's, it's all over here. It's everywhere. It's everywhere we go. It's there. Fruitfulness, fruitfulness, fruitfulness. I'll, I'll give you one more. You and I were made to display fruitfulness. God is not just calling us to work. He's calling us to bear fruit in our work. I'll talk about that in a moment. God desires for us to actively engage with the world around us. He wants us to be productive. In other words, he wants us to live out our productivity in whatever social or cultural, cultural spheres he has placed us in. That, that the, the very place that you are in is for a purpose. The very fact that we are alive in this time is for a purpose, yeah. is to display the fruitfulness that comes from God. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10, it says, for we are God's masterpiece. The Greek word there is poema, that we are God's poem. I don't know if you've ever been to a spoken word event. It's one of the most incredible things in, like, just to be a part of. When you hear word after word after word strung together so beautifully to tell a story, it is incredible. And then the Bible tells us that you and I, we are that. That, 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 that the angels look and, and it's just, it's you after you after you after you. It's God's beautiful poem on display. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. It's not like you come to faith and then God's going, oh, okay, I wasn't expecting you. Let me quickly, what are you supposed to do? There's got to be something. Jesus, um, were you, ex that's not what I, he's like, no. I, I planned this. Long before you were even a thought in your parents' mind, I already had a plan for you to display fruitfulness to the heavens. You and I were made to display fruitfulness. I mean, I could go on and on and on. There are so many other places. But what's important is I want you to understand that fruitfulness matters. That in the season, as we cry out for more, one of the things that we're going to cry out for is to be more fruitful. God, would we be more fruitful in the short time that we have? And it is. It is short. In light of eternity, in light of eternity, and I know some of you want to live 80, 90, 100. God bless you. But even a hundred years, in light of eternity, yeah. when, when we read in the Old Testament and we read folks who lived longer than a hundred, we go, wow, man, they lived for so long. But, but actually, as Christians, we should go, wow, their lives were cut short. Be because we were designed to live forever. Yeah. So 120 years is short by God's standards. And that's our fault. That's because of the sin, yeah. the sin by our hands. But he makes a plan. He makes a way. He sends his son Jesus and he says, no, 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 no. It's okay. I, I still want you to live forever. Surrender your life to Jesus. That's the plan. Fruitfulness matters. In the short time that we have here on earth, God, how, how, how might I be more fruitful? What kind of fruitfulness are you calling me to? Now, in answering this question, I want us to be super practical, right? This is a super practical part of the sermon. And if you're like me, you love practical. I like being told what to do. Especially once I get it, I'm like, okay, cool, I get it, it's there, it's in the Bible, God said it, so we do it. 
I'm that kind of guy. Like, I'm a, I, I'm a great soldier in the army. That's what you want me. You want more of me. It's like, hey, this is what you're supposed to do. Go do it. Now, I feel a certain way. And I get that. Like, I feel like there's a, I have lots of feelings. I'm like, oh, I, don't feel like I don't feel like loving my enemy. Go love your enemy. All right? He said, go love my enemy. Try not to look at anyone. <laughs> so let's get super practical. But before I do, it's important for us to know this. That yes, God demands fruitfulness. He does. He desires that for us. He demands it. He wants it. God demands fruitfulness. But what's very important for us to know is that in this garden, God is the gardener. Yeah, amen. God is amen. the gardener. Now you might go, oh no, why, yeah. why, does, why does that matter? Well, b- because, one, it tells us who we are, but also it liberates us. It liberates us. God is the God. In fact, he owns the God. The God is his. That, that should be so liberating. Yeah. John chapter 15, verse 1. Jesus says, I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. Jesus, right out the gates, informs us that he is the true vine on which the fruit grows. And God, God the Father, is the gardener. We'll take it. Hashtag about Spaces 2022, of which we want more. How many? 150 women coming to the next Spaces retreat. I'm praying for more. I don't know about you ladies, but I'm praying for more. God is the gardener. The garden belongs to God. We cannot find our purpose without realizing our place. And our place is not the gardener. We don't own the garden. It doesn't belong to us. And so we just need to sit back. Some of us just need to sit back and recognize that for a moment. Because so often we act, especially if you're a leader, you act like, you know what, I'm actually in charge. I'm the one that makes things grow. That's not how it works. In a garden, the branch doesn't tell the vine what to do. Guys, I worked really, really hard on this illustration, considering that I'm not a gardener, I'm not a green person. I've told you before, uh, gardens and the bush are trying to kill me, right? (laughs) Sinuses, pollen, so I really worked hard. For some of you, green fingers. In a garden, the branch doesn't tell the vine what to do. On a farm, the plants don't tell the farmer how to get the job done. Can you imagine a plant telling the gardener, no, 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 hold on. Uh, before you snip there, just wait. I mean, it's, it's, it sounds ridiculous, but this is what we do. The gardener knows what's best for the plants. He's the one who cultivates and works and cuts and removes and fertilizes and waters and covers and sprays, and he does all of this for very good reasons. And a good plant, what does a good plant do? A good plant simply trusts the gardener. That's it. That's it. You simply trust the gardener. And there may be no harder principle than this one to put into practice for many of us. To simply trust. And that could mean a world of things. And again, we'll get into that. Just hold on. But to simply trust. To say, you know what, God... You've called me to a life of fruitfulness. You're the gardener. This all belongs to you. I'm going to trust you. I'm just going to trust you. When it comes to this spiritual notion of bearing fruit, the bad news for some of us is that the Lord demands you to release control. That's the call. And so for for you, this morning, that's what God's calling you to do, is to just release, release control. For some of you, it might be for the very first time. For the very first time. You've labeled yourself a Christian. You show up to Sunday gatherings. You maybe read the Bible. You definitely know John 3.16. 
but you've never released control. So, so, some of us, we, we, we have this illusion that, that no, 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 I am in a buddy-buddy kind of co-thing with God. Now, now, I get it. By grace, he calls us to participate in what he's doing, but that's completely different to the work of salvation. You do absolutely nothing. In fact, you, you are like a beggar looking to heaven going, I need a favor. That's what salvation means. It's just, God, God I, I just need, I need, I need a favor. I've tried, I've tried, I've tried, and on my own, I can do nothing. I need a favor. And it's the one prayer that I know with 100% certainty that God will deliver on every single time. To release control. But maybe you have crossed the line of faith and and, and you're going, God, I walk with you, I I, I abide, I'm I'm with you, but, but there are areas in my life where it's just, it's dry. My question would be, have you released control in that area? It's like, no, God, you can definitely take my time, my talents, my, my, my trophies. (laughs) We have to release control. There is no other option. You and I have no right to tell God how to do his business. No more than a plant has any right to give instructions to the farmer. It just doesn't work that way. And so this is why I call it bad news for some of us because that first step is just going, you know what, I need to release control. And that sucks. It's not great, I know. But the reward, the reward, so what is the good news? The good news is that you don't have to carry the weight of being in control. That's the good news. You don't have to carry the weight. The branch does that, the vine does that, God does that. Your only job is to bear fruit. That's it. To position yourself in such a way that you are like, I I I am in the best place to be fruitful. That's the call. Oh, now what does that look like? Just wait, we're going to get there. We're going to get super practical. Just hold on. Let me read the rest of John 15. From verse 2, it says this, Every branch in me, this is Jesus speaking, that does not produce fruit, he removes. And he prunes every branch that produces fruit so that it will produce more fruit. Now, I read a ton of commentaries here, and most of them point in this direction, that when you're being pruned, it is a painful experience. Suffering is involved. But there is purpose to that suffering. It's so that you might produce more fruit. And so some of you are in that season of pruning. Maybe the beginning of 2023 for you is to position yourself in such a way that you can be pruned by the Father. But remember, there's a purpose to that pruning. It's so that you might be more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me, hashtag Abide, and I in you, just as a branch is unable to produce fruit by itself unless it remains on the vine, neither can you unless you remain in me. So any plans that we have separated from Jesus, just stop. Just stop. I am the vine, you are the branches. The one who remains in me and I in him produces much fruit. Not just fruit, not just some fruit, not just a little bit of fruit, much fruit, fruitfulness. Friends, I want to be a church that produces much fruit. I want to be a person that produces much fruit. Because you can do nothing without me. If anyone does not remain in me, he is thrown aside like a branch and he withers. They gather them, throw them into the fire, and they are burnt. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you want. Can you believe that Jesus actually said that? So if you remain in me and I remain in you, go ahead, ask. And remember what I said last week. I I said some of us are asking too little. We're dreaming too little. 
some of that, some of that little might be because you're actually not remaining. And you, you know that, right? Like, you know, you're like, I'm actually, I'm not, I'm not remaining. And so, you know, like, I'm not going to ask for much because it's going to be kind of ridiculous. I'm going to be exposed. Ask whatever you want and it'll be done for you. And then here, verse 8, my father is glorified by this. It means that he loves this. It pleases him when we do this. It becomes a sweet aroma to him that you produce much fruit and prove, prove, prove to be my disciples. Oh, would 2023 be that year where if you say you are a Christian and someone says prove, you don't quickly jump back and go, don't judge me. Stop judging me. It's like it's the weirdest thing in the world. It's like, it's, imagine if I was a medical doctor and, and you showed up to my practice and you, maybe you were like, I'm not, I'm not sure, like this place, I mean, I don't know. Looks more like, like a car garage. And, and then you go, hey, you a doctor? I go, absolutely. And then you go, prove it. And I go, don't judge me. Like, think about it. It'd be like, I want, guys, I want to see receipts. I want to see the certificate. I, I, like, I want I, show me something that says that you are a doctor. And yet, we do that out there with other people. But when in the Bible it says, no, but show me, you're like, ah, no, just hold on. That you produce much fruit and prove to be my disciples. Do you want to glorify God? Ruth of Fellowship, do, do we want to glorify God? Yeah. Jesus in John 15, verse 8 says that we are to produce much fruit. That we are to produce much fruit. That we are to be fruitful. More and more and more and more and more and more. To be fruitful. Now, let's talk about the fruit in your life. In our lives. Let's get super practical. I'm going to be quick. I'm going to move through these super fast. And then we're going to respond. What comes to mind when you think a fruitful life? For me, it's the word abundance. It's the word that Jesus uses in John 10, 10, right? The word abundance stands out for me. I'm reminded of, of all the areas in which God can produce fruit in my life and that he, and he can produce more of it, that there can be an abundance of fruit in my life. And so I'm just going to give you a, a list. I'm going to give you six, six areas. And this is not an exhaustive list. It's not, it's not everything. It's not like there's, I know there's way more, but let me just give you six. Six areas that I believe we can cry out to God and say, God, would you make me, would you make us more fruitful? Number one, Faith. God, would we be more fruitful in our faith and, and, and all the aspects of our faith yeah. in our prayer lives? Yeah. Maybe this is the year that for some of us, we actually begin to write out our prayers. I'm not saying that you should, but if it will produce more fruit, what do you have to lose? It's a practice that I began doing. I write out my prayers and it's been so fruitful for me in my prayer life. Because now I pray with intention. Have you ever been at a prayer meeting where you're like, you just, you know, you're praying, you're praying, you don't know what to pray anymore, you're just like, I don't know, and then you repeat, and then it's just like, then it's almost like, then you walk out of there and you're like, but what did I just do? Like, what just happened? Because half the time you were thinking about what you were going to do tomorrow. Or maybe someone says to you, hey, listen, I'm going through X, Y, Z, would you pray for me? I got you. <laughs> and then you see them next week, and literally you're walking up to them. Oh my goodness, Father God, I pray for confidence. I pray for you. <laughs> hey, prayed for you. How was it? But, but if you just took time, if you just took time and wrote out your prayers, the other really cool thing about it is that it's now written down, I, the opportunity to hand this down to the next generation. I'm hoping my grandkids one day will open up some of these books and go, who's Mo? <laughs> Whoever he is, I pray that God delivered that. I just hope that his life was full. Like, you know what I mean? Like, like imagine that. We, we read Spurgeon's prayers, and if you don't know who Spurgeon is, go Google him after this, incredible man. 
We read his prayer. Like, wow, amazing. I could never do that. Guys, all he did was write down his prayers. So God, would we be fruitful in our prayer lives? Would we be fruitful in studying and meditating on God's word? I know what that means. Maybe you need to get a schedule. Maybe, I don't know. Come speak to me. We'll figure it out. But God wants you to be fruitful in the word. So that it's, it's not just John 3.16 that you know. Yeah. That at any moment you could call up God's word. Yeah. Yeah, amen. Fruitful, fruitfulness and in, in, in praise. I had worship here, but I'm like, no, no, no. All of life is worship. In our praise. It's a big one. That we would show up on a Sunday with the saints gathered together and that we would praise the one who is seated on his throne. Amen. To the point where it's like, like every Sunday should be like, after the gathering, folks should be like, hey, how are you doing? You're good, man. <laughs> what happened to your voice? Bro, I just sang it out to the Lord. He has it now. <laughs> God's calling us to be fruitful in our faith. Maybe for you, it's in hospitality, in encouragement. It's in taking a proper rest. Second one. I believe God's calling us to be fruitful in our physical, mental, and emotional well-being. Let me read to you 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 to 20. It says, do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit within you? Whom you have from God. You are not your own. For you were bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. In all of your body. Physical. Mental. Emotional. First Corinthians chapter 10 verse 31 says this, and it's so powerful. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, whatever you do, you know what you can put in whatever you do? Whatever you do. <laughs> do all to the glory of God. So maybe this year, you're going to consider how you can glorify God with your body. Exercise, improve nutrition, maybe investing in counseling for a healthier mind. Oh, no, I don't have the money. I saw you at Starbucks. <laughs> On your Instagram, I saw. Ha hashtag New Year, Starbucks. It's like a 40 rand cup of coffee. A good friend of mine said this to me, and it blew me out the water. Like, I had no place to hide when he says this. He was like, you know, so many people complain about not being rich and not realizing. I understand. I understand. Because we're going to talk about being fruitful in our finances. So just wait. I understand that like, sometimes we don't feel like we're rich. But friends, in this room, do you know how wealthy you are? If you've ever complained about hangers, not having enough hangers, <laughs> where are the hangers? We don't have enough hangers. Do you know what that means? You have way too many clothes. So, so I'm just saying, I'm just saying, right? Yours is clothes, mine is shoes, we all have issues. Consider, consider what it would look like for you to glorify him physically, mentally, emotionally. Number three, God's calling us to be more fruitful in our relationships. Here's a big one, here's a big one, all right? Set the, set the tone. There is a challenge, and I understand that, as an African, I understand it, but I think just as people, we understand this. Balancing my blood family and my blood bought family. It's like, how do I, what? Look, and the Bible calls us, it calls us to be faithful and fruitful to our blood family. Yes. Honor your blood family where you can. But there's also a call. In fact, there's so much. In fact, the gospel, the gospel speaks about our blood bought family. That's why I can look across the room and go, these are my brothers and my sisters. That, that on the cross, Jesus himself looks, looks, and he says, mom, son, son, mom. They could have easily got, no, 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 we're not, no, we're not. To one. He's like, no, 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 blood-bought family. Our blood family matters, but hear this, guys, hear this, hear this. There is coming a time for everyone, everyone, where we will die, we will be put in the ground. People will show up and say nice things. Hopefully they don't lie. And then you'll just lay there and your blood will run out. Did you hear that? That is a certainty for all of us. Your blood will run out, but there is a blood. Amen. There is a blood that never runs out. This blood, this blood saves. 
This blood heals. This blood restores. This blood reconciles. Because I get it. Some of you are like, but my blood family, there's some issues there. Well, then why don't you draw on the blood of Jesus and come around your blood-bought family so that that blood may flow. And then let's watch and see what God does. God's calling us to be fruitful in our family. This speaks about community, but we'll get into that in a couple of weeks. Number four, I believe God's calling us to be fruitful in our work, in our function, maybe what you call your career. I'm going to encourage you here to get honest with yourself and to ask the question, am I in the right job? Like, why am I doing this? Like, has God called me to this? And it's not about the status or the title of what it is. It's about, like, what I'm doing. Because, friends, you know, we spend 90,000 hours of our lives at work. That's a third of our lives. I feel like if it's going to take a third of our lives, then we should actually ask God, God, should I be doing this? Should I be doing this? And not just doing it, but being fruitful in it. I think way too many people, it's like, the hustle, man. The grind. Prison. God created work. It's, it's not a product of the fall. Work existed before the fall. And so it was beautifully designed by, by God. And so when, when we go, oh, work, whatever, you know, oh, I hate it. Like, I don't want to do this. I'd rather be doing something else. Then go do something else. Trust God for it. I want us to be fruitful in our careers. I want you guys to hold the highest positions that you can. And I said, look, again, 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 it's not about titles, it's not about states, it's not about those things. But man, if, if God's calling you to that kind of fruitfulness so that you might have kingdom influence, then by all means, get that position. I'll pray with you. Being fruitful, number five, in our finances. I believe God's calling us to be fruitful in our finances. Notice I didn't say rich. I'm not saying that it, it's not, but I'm saying I didn't say that. I don't know if God's called everyone here to be incredibly wealthy. I don't. I don't. But I know that God's called us to be fruitful yes. with our finances. And so that means that whatever I have, I am going to be fruitful. That means I'm going to be incredibly generous. God's called us to a life of generosity. We are called to be generous. So God, would you, would you make me fruitful in my finances so that I might be a great steward of what you have given me to put on display how you take care of me and then so that I might be generous to those around me? Amen. But first, some of you need to ask the question, if you were God, would you give you more money? Now I know, I, I know, your first reaction would be absolutely, <laughs> for sure. And then I'd go, okay, why? I'd be so generous with it. Show me. Well, I would do this and this and this. I'd stop you. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I didn't say tell me. Show me. Show me how you're being generous now. Show me how you're being generous with the little that you have now. It's easy to go, you know, if I was a millionaire, here are the things that I would do. I would give, I would help the needy, I would, it's like, but why aren't you doing that now? Yeah. Jesus talks about this in the parable of the talents in Matthew 25, verse 14 to 30. Go, go read it, it's, in, like, it's amazing. Like he, he took, gives these guys some stuff and he says, okay, hey, go, go, go be fruitful. And they go, two of them go and, and the other one buries it. And he comes back, and it's, it literally, it's just a show and tell. He's like, oh, Jesus, you gave me this. Here's what I did. Boom. Amazing. Blessings. Here's what I did. Amazing. The other one, talking for days. <laughs> Nothing to show, just talking. Well, you know, because I know that you are a da 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 He's just like, you know what? No, no, no. <laughs> Friends, I want us to be fruitful in our finances. I want us to be incredibly generous. And we're going to talk about this, and we're going to have some powerful ways to respond in a couple of weeks regarding this. Matthew 6, verse 21, says, For where your treasure is, there will be your heart also. I'm going to call the band to come up, and then we're just going to close out and then respond. The last one, as the band comes up, I believe God's calling us to be fruitful. Number six, here it is, in our missional lives. God's calling us to be fruitful in our missional lives. God has commissioned us. He's commissioned us to go and make disciples. 
What does that mean? Well, it means that salvation should matter to us. People coming to faith, people crossing the line of faith, people surrendering their lives to Jesus as Lord and Savior. It should matter to us. Why? Because we're called to make disciples. How do you make a disciple? Well, firstly, that person needs to cross the line of faith. How do they do that? By hearing the gospel. Friends, the gospel is both information and it's an invitation. Uh, So I go, to share the gospel means that you've given information. Who is Jesus? Why did he have to come? Who am I? What do I mean to God? And then it's an invitation to say, would you surrender your life to Jesus as Lord and Savior? Salvations matter, but not just salvations, baptisms matter. If salvation matters, then baptisms matter. And so, God, I want us to be fruitful in our baptisms. Baptism is is an outward expression of an internal reality. It's someone going, you know what? Hey, I love Jesus. I surrender to him. And then the third thing with regards to our missional lives that we should be concerned about is healthy disciples making more healthy disciples. The thing feeds into itself. See, when we make healthy disciples, then what they do is they go out and share the gospel and then God does an amazing work and then they come to faith and then we baptize them into the community and into the faith and into all that God has called us to, the promises that are all yes and amen in Christ and then we send them out to go make more disciples. That's how God intended it to be. And so I want us to be more fruitful, more fruitful in our missional lives. So that's just six. That's literally six. I could have given you way more, but I'll start you off with six. And here's what we're going to do. We're going to respond. I say this every week. The gospel demands a response. And so we're going to respond. We're going to respond by praying. We're going to respond by singing. And then we're going to respond by obeying. And not just in our hearts, but that it would, it would flow from our hearts to the rest of our bodies where we're going, okay, God, I'm going to take you at your word. You've called me to be fruitful, and and, and you're going to pick one of these. You're going to pick two of these. You're going to pick all of these. I don't care. Just pick. I know you're not perfect. There's an area in your life where you need fruitfulness. And then what you're going to do is I'm going to pray. They're going to play. They're going to sing. We'll figure it out. And then, then folks, you're going to come up, and you're you're going to go here to this beautiful fruit station. Please don't take anything. Not quite yet. But, but in this, in this one of the boxes, there's a little card like this. It looks like a business card, super small. On the front, it says hashtag more. On the back, it says hashtag fruitfulness. You're going to grab a pen, and you're going to write. You're going to write one of those things. If you're going, oh, no, I've got two, then take two cards. On a six, take six, ten. I got ten. There's things on it you didn't mention that I need. Write it out. Friends, we're just, we're just, we're being obedient. And it's got to move from the heart. And you're going to write it out. You can go back to your seat. You can, I don't care. What, it's going to be chaos. God doesn't care. God is not, he's not going, oh my goodness, I needed an order one by one. God doesn't care. He's like, in the chaos, I am at work. And so you're going to show up, pick one, write it, and then you're going to drop it here at the prayer corner. All right? So you're going to write it out. You're going to walk here, and then you're just going to leave it here at the prayer corner. Why? So that folks can, after the gathering, we're going to gather those up, and then folks are going to be praying for you. Week in, week out, for that thing, for you, for fruitfulness. And then it doesn't end there. Why? Because we want to take God at His word. When those things begin to happen in your life, my hope is that you would tell someone. My hope is that you would tell us so that we might share testimonies of what God is doing in this community. Friends, if, we, if, we, if I have a sermon prepped and 20 of you guys show up and you're like, I need to tell you about what God is doing. You know what I do? We'll see that sermon next week. One by one, let's hear about God's goodness in your life. That itself is a sermon. To hear like, God, I trusted God for this. I trusted him at his word. Yes and amen. And people were praying for me. They came alongside me. They, they didn't leave me to be on my own. Would you, would you take a risk? Because that's what, guys, that's what it feels like. I know we talk about taking a step of faith, and that's right. But in reality, for, for many of the things that we're asking, it feels like a risk. It just, it feels like a risk. I don't have everything together. Because 
me, you, this is what we do. It needs to be perfectly in place and then God, I'll do it. God goes, no, that's not the environment that I work in. You know what environment I work in? It's just taking a step of faith. I'm going to trust him. I need to forgive someone in my family. I'm going to trust you, God. God, I want to grow in hospitality. I'm, I'm an introvert. I don't know. I'm going to trust you. God, I want to grow in my finance. I want to be generous. I want to give over and above. What, like, I just want to, I'm going to trust you. God, I want to share my faith with you. Know, I'm trusting God. I'm trusting God that this year will be the year my younger brother comes to faith. Go ahead. I've just told everyone, pray with me. So will you obey? So I'm going to pray, and then in a moment, we'll just come up, come up whenever you want, grab one, and then just throw it there. Go back to your seat. Continue to pray. We'll sing. We'll close this out. And let's trust God for fruitfulness in this year. And so, Father God, we come now asking that you would do these amazing, great things. God, we are asking for more. We're asking for more, exceedingly more, immeasurably more, abundantly more. We want to produce fruit because Jesus, you said it glorifies the Father. So God, would you use us imperfect people? None of us are perfect in here. We're all in desperate need of a Savior. And so help us, Lord. Help us. God, whether it's in, in our faith, in our prayer lives, in our praise, in our worship, in, in, like if it's that, then God, would you call us to that? Maybe for some of us, it's with our finances or our careers or relationships. Maybe it's, it's saying no to something so that we might say yes to you. God, we want to be more fruitful. Would you prune us? Make us more fruitful. We ask all of this in Jesus' beautiful wonderful name.